Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at a bio-inspired iron complex that specifically targets colorectal cancer. This work was published in Chemical Science by the groups of Wu Kyung Bae, Kyung Hyun Yu, and Sung Woo Hong in their paper Bio-inspired non-heme iron complex that triggers mitochondrial apoptotic signaling pathway specifically for colorectal cancer cells. This research comes under the field of bioinorganic chemistry, which studies the roles of metals in biology, and also the development of metal-based therapeutics. This is an attractive strategy, as metals offer a wider range of geometries, oxidation states, and reactivity than conventional organic-based drugs. Bioinorganic chemistry is at the very foundation of modern medicinal chemistry. Its roots go back to Paul Ehrlich, who developed Salvarsan, an arsenic-based drug for the treatment of syphilis, in 1907. While we now take for granted that specific microbes and receptors can be targeted by specific chemicals, this idea was new at the time, and Ehrlich called this a magic bullet concept. Ehrlich postulated that the biological effects of a chemical compound are based on its chemical composition and this could be optimised to develop targeted medicines that can attack pathogens, yet remain harmless in healthy tissues. This concept was largely informed by his pioneering research into immunology, as he was one of the first scientists to propose the existence of specific receptors that bind to specific molecules that we now refer to as antigens. Many of the metals currently used in medicine are not normally present in the body, and are therefore prone to off-target interactions which can cause side effects. These include metals, such as platinum, which is used in anti-cancer chemotherapy, silver, which is used in antimicrobial wound dressings, and gadolinium, which is used as a contrast agent in diagnostic procedures. An alternative approach to using these compounds is to develop drugs using metals which are normally found in the body, as we possess metabolic pathways to regulate and excrete them. The complexes investigated in this study utilise the 2 picolyl aiming binding motif, which is often utilised in the design of metallodrugs. These type of ligands are quite attractive as they can strongly chelate metals, resulting in stable complexes. One example is this dizinc complex, which incorporates a bridging phenylate ligand between the two zinc atoms, and also a fluorescent bodipi moiety. This allows for the distribution of the compound within the cell to be easily visualised. Compounds of this type have shown strong antiparasitic activity, and in this example, it showed great activity against the parasites that cause malaria. In 2019, Eva Royo's group reported chiral palladium and platinum complexes, incorporating the 2 picol amine motif, in addition to a coordinating hydroxyl amine group. These compounds showed activity against cancer, and also in promoting wound healing. I have worked with some of these compounds myself, including some that had tunable activity against different types of parasites such as in this example, where the copper complexes showed activity against trypanosoma cruzi, while the zinc complexes of the same ligand showed activity against Leishmania amazonensis. The use of 2 picol amine is not limited to just amines. It is also frequently used to make shift bases, where there is a double bond between the nitrogen and carbon. These shift bases, also known as imines, can be synthesized from a dehydration reaction with the corresponding ketone or aldehyde and in this example reported by the Kepler group, they used it to derivatize a molecule with known bioactivity to enable it to bind to ruthenium and generate compounds that show anti-cancer activity in three different cell lines. The ligand used in this study was synthesized using a reductive amination strategy. 2-pyridine carboxaldehyde was reacted with 2-aminoethoxyethanol with catalytic acetic acid. This forms a shift base which was reduced with sodium triacetoxyborohydride. The secondary amine produced by this reaction reacts with a further equivalent of the aldehyde, again forming a shift base which is reduced by the borohydride. This reaction was carried out in one pot and generated the compound in a 79% yield. To form the metal complexes, the ligand was reacted in a 1 to 1 ratio with the selected metal salt. The first complex was formed by the reaction with manganese dichloride. This formed a six-coordinate octahedral complex with the ligand binding in a facial manner and the two chlorides 
coordinated in a cis-type fashion. The reaction with copper nitrate formed a copper complex with a similar geometry, in this case with one molecule of water acting as a ligand and the other coordination site occupied by a nitrate ligand, with the other nitrate present as a counterion. The reaction with iron 2 perchlorate also formed an octahedral complex. However, in this case, the terminal hydroxyl group also coordinates to the metal, leaving both perchlorate ions acting as counterions, which is to be expected, as perchlorate ions are very rarely seen coordinating to a metal in the inner sphere complex. The complex formed with cobalt nitrate also features a ligand binding through all five possible coordinating atoms. And as was seen in the copper nitrate complex, one nitrate is found coordinated to the metal and the other acts as a counterion to balance the charge. We can see the reason for the difference in these two binding modes by looking at the crystal structures of the complexes. If we look at the crystal structures of the manganese complex and the copper complex, which was previously reported by metzler nolt we can see that the bond between the metal and the ethereal oxygen is elongated. However, when we look at the crystal structures of the iron and cobalt complexes, we can see that the metal oxygen bond is much shorter at about 2.1 angstroms. This shorter bond brings the terminal oxygen closer to the metal and allows it to coordinate, unlike in the manganese and copper complexes, where this oxygen is held further away and hence cannot get close enough to coordinate to the metal, leaving that coordination site to be occupied by a different ligand. We can attribute this bond elongation to the Jan Teller effect. The Jan Teller theorem states that any nonlinear molecule with a spatially degenerate electronic ground state will undergo a geometrical distortion that removes that degeneracy to lower the overall energy of the system. To put this simply, if a complex has orbitals of the same energy but they are occupied by a different number of electrons, the complex will distort and thereby change the energy of the orbitals so that they are no longer degenerate. This is quite commonly seen in copper II complexes as it has a D9 electronic configuration. In an octahedral geometry, this creates two sets of degenerate orbitals, the XY yz and zx, which are termed the T2g orbitals, and also the eg set, which contains the z squared and x squared minus y squared orbitals. As copper 2 has 9d electrons, all of the degenerate T2g orbitals will be filled, leaving one eg orbital with two electrons and the other eg orbital with one. This produces a complex that has degenerate orbitals with unequal occupancy. The complex will therefore undergo Jan Teller distortion to either elongate or compress these bonds, and this lowers the energy of the orbitals with the Z component. This distortion can be clearly seen in this copper complex, as the equatorial bonds are approximately two angstroms long, while the axial bonds are elongated, having bond lengths of 2.99 and 2.56 angstroms. This Jan Teller distortion can also occur in low spin D5 complexes, and may influence the structure of the manganese complex. However, the authors did not supply any data that would allow us to conclusively determine if the complex is low spin or high spin. Given the nature of this ligand and the position of its coordinating moieties in the spectrochemical series, it is feasible to suggest that the ligand would produce a low spin manganese complex, which could therefore be susceptible to Jan Teller distortion. The factors that influence the coordination geometry and electronic structure of D metal complexes can be quite intricate, so if you want me to do a deep dive on this topic, let me know in the comments down below. So let's look at the reactivity of these complexes. During the attempts to crystallize the iron complex, the researchers discovered that it formed a dimeric structure with a bridging oxygen atom linking the two metal centers. They were able to prove that the source of this oxygen atom was from dioxygen in the atmosphere by carrying out the crystallization using a heavy isotope of oxygen. They found that this complex could activate oxygen from other sources, such as hydrogen peroxide, iodosobenzene, or BNAH with acid, which is an analogue of NADH. The activation of oxygen by iron complexes has been well studied, and there are two pathways proposed for this reactivity. In the first pathway, dioxygen binds to the iron 2 complex and is reduced, forming a peroxy anion bound to an iron 3 species. This undergoes a comproportionation reaction with another equivalent of the iron 2 complex, forming a dimeric structure with a bridging peroxide. This can then disproportionate into an iron 4 oxide species 
and this reacts with another equivalent of the iron 2 species, forming the dimeric structure with both iron atoms in the plus 3 oxidation state and a bridging oxygen atom. The second pathway follows a similar mechanism. In this case, hydrogen peroxide first binds to the iron complex, forming the iron 3 species, and the loss of the hydroxyl radical produces the iron 4 complex, which then goes on to dimerize to form the observed product. To probe this reactivity, they carried out a fluorescence assay using terephthalic acid. Upon oxidation with hydroxyl radical, this forms a compound that fluoresces strongly at 395 nanometers. Of all of the complexes studied, only the iron complex was able to carry out this reaction and show this signal. A weak signal was observed for the ligand itself without metals present, but this is not due to the oxidation of terephthalic acid, but rather a low level of intrinsic fluorescence from the ligand itself. To assess the anti-cancer potential of these compounds, they administered the molecules to several different cell lines. They used two controls in these studies, one with no compound, and the other using just deionized water, without any compounds present. They then assessed the viability of the cancer cells, relative to the control samples that had no compounds administered. None of the compounds tested showed any significant activity in either the breast cancer or cervical cancer cells studied. However, when they studied these compounds in colorectal cell lines, they found that the iron complex showed a significant reduction in cell viability in both cell lines and did not show any cytotoxicity when administered to fibroblast cells from healthy skin. To see if these compounds were generating reactive oxygen species within the cells, they carried out an assay using dichlorofluorescein diacetate. This compound forms a fluorescent molecule upon reaction with reactive oxygen species and allows the researchers to quantify the oxidative stress induced by these compounds upon the cells. They found that the iron complex significantly increased the levels of ROS observed in the colorectal cancer cells, with little activity found for the other metals tested. In the healthy cells, they found that the reactive oxygen species were also elevated, but not to the same degree as was seen in the cancer cells. Satisfied with the knowledge that this iron complex worked with a mechanism involving the generation of reactive oxygen species, they then sought to elucidate the pathways leading to the death of the cancer cells. They used a fluorescent stain that binds to DNA to visualize the nuclei of the cells, and they observed structural changes in the cells administered with the iron complex that are indicative of apoptosis. They also observed a significant reduction in the area of the nuclei, and also the number of nuclei present within the samples treated with the iron complex. To prove that these cells were dying through apoptosis and not necrosis, they carried out a QRT-PCR assay, that is, a quantitative reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. This method amplifies the RNA found in a sample extract and allows researchers to quantify the expression of different proteins within the cell. They found that in the samples treated with the iron complex, there was a reduction in the expression of the BCL2 alpha and beta proteins, which have an anti-apoptotic effect. They also found a significant increase in the expression of BAC and BAX proteins, which show pro-apoptotic activity and support the hypothesis that the iron complex is triggering apoptosis. In the next studies carried out, they used a fluorescent antibody to visualize the levels of COX-4 within the cells. This is a useful biomarker as the levels are reduced during mitochondria-mediated apoptosis. As can be clearly seen in the images, these levels are significantly reduced in the cells treated with the iron complex. To support these studies, they also performed western blots to detect levels of cleaved caspase 9, caspase 3 and PARP1. The cleavage of these proteins is a hallmark of apoptosis and can be seen in the samples treated with the iron complex with little to no cleavage seen in the control samples. There are two broad categories of apoptosis which can occur. Intrinsic apoptosis occurs when there is damage within the cell, whereas extrinsic apoptosis is seen when damage occurs to the cell from the outside. To determine which pathway was occurring, they fluorescently labelled E. cadherin, a type of adhesion molecule which interacts with death receptors when apoptosis occurs through an extrinsic pathway. They also quantified the levels of BID, which is also involved in the extrinsic apoptosis pathway. The researchers didn't find any significant changes in the levels of these molecules, and this suggests that the compound is acting through the intrinsic pathway. To further confirm this hypothesis, they carried out cell viability assays using a caspase inhibitor. 
in the cells treated with the iron complex. They saw a reduction in cell viability in the cancer cells, as was to be expected. However, when they also used a caspase inhibitor, no apoptosis was seen and the iron complex was rendered ineffective. The assays carried out using healthy fibroblast cells did not show any differences in activity for any of the combinations tested. So with all of this data, the researchers propose the following mode of action. First, the mononuclear iron complex enters the cell where it is oxidized to the dimeric species in a process that generates reactive oxygen species. This causes mitochondrial dysfunction and triggers the intrinsic apoptotic signaling pathway. This causes the release of cytochrome C into the cytosol followed by the cleavage of caspase 9 and caspase 3. This induces the cleavage of PARP1 which ultimately leads to apoptosis. In their final and most exciting experiment they carried out in vivo studies using mice. In this experiment six mice were injected with colorectal cancer cells and the growth of the tumour was monitored. Between day 7 and day 11 three of the mice were administered with the iron complex at a dose of 5 mg per cake. In these mice the researchers observed a drastic decrease in the growth of the tumour with up to an 80% growth inhibition. These experiments indicate that this iron complex has great potential for use as a therapy for colorectal cancer and it is a compound that I will definitely be keeping my eye on in future. Well that brings us to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it please like and subscribe and if you have anything you'd like to see let me know in the comments down below. In the next video we will look at silylpyrrole oxidation en route to saxitoxin congeners including 11 saxitoxin ethanoic acid.